<laughs> All right, guys. Our next guest makes his long-awaited return as he takes on Claudio Puez at UFC 281 in New York City at the iconic Madison Square Garden, one of our absolute favorites to chat to. If we had an office, there would definitely be a boardroom named after this man, Dan the Hangman Hooker. Welcome back, man. It's been too long. How are you? Been cool, lads. Been cool. Whole boardroom. What do you think? The Dan Hooker boardroom? Nice chairs too. Table, some chairs. I, would. I wanna uh, I can get my post fight job there. Like uh, I'll be the Forrest Griffin of um <laughs> That's it. But it'll just be like the three of us. And then uh, and we won't there'll be a lot less money. <laughs> it'll and be like a big it'd be a big office, but not there's not much to we'll talk to. We're gonna get more people. It's a you know, Rome wasn't built in a day, lads. That's true. But in the meantime, we'll be like Murray from Flight of the Concords holding band meetings. Band meeting, <laughs> doing a roll call with three people. <laughs> <laughs> Just screenshots uh, of you from over the years on Submission Radio. That should be a coffee table book, actually. Mm. We're going to have a think about that as well. All right. So you're in the Big Apple. Got to tell us, man, how's New York been treating you so far? How's it feel to know that you'll be fighting at MSG? You know, it's just a matter of days now. Yeah, well, we're actually um, we're actually not in New York. We flew oh. to New York, but we're uh, we're somewhere. I don't know if we're allowed to tell. It's a secret location. Are. Secret location. It's a big secret. I can I can definitely tell you the state. Like we're in um, we're in New Jersey. We're at like a just a big like kind of compound out here. It's like um, Ray it Longo's me, house. No, nah, it reminds me of the. Um, <laughs> The X Men, you know, like the X Men, um, uh, where they all, where they all the big stay, school. like the big school, the manor thing. Yeah, it's like there's like twenty of us. I say there's like at least twenty. There's like more on the way here, and we're just, it's just, just the boys here hanging out, training. Um, we've all got our spaces. There's pool, basketball court. Uh, it's very, it's very cool. It's very cool um, being surrounded by like all your teammates and your. And your friends and coaches and stuff like that. It's something that um it's something that yeah. I definitely it's much better with people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Twenty of you. Fuck I know. Eugene Berriman's school for gifted youths or, or whatever the X Men place is called. He's yeah. definitely Professor Xavier. But also like you, Brad, Israel, Carlos on the card, the awesome foursome. Yeah. Dude, what's the energy been like in the gym ahead of this one? It's been like definitely the hardest push um, of my career, like the training camp and stuff like that. Just I guess I guess just with the amount of time that we've all kind of been at that level, or like myself in Israel, like having I think it's like twenty fights in the UFC. Like been there for a long time, been mm. there for like eight years, you know. So just to find a new level after that is very difficult. And, and that takes like a, a very big push. So our coaches got together and kind of ramped up our training. And I feel like it's definitely been the hardest training camp or the hardest push um, of my career. And the body's held up well, and I feel like I'm in a good place. But yeah, it was, it was so much, it, regardless of how hard it was, for me personally, it was so much fun to be like surrounded by everyone again and to just be in the trenches with, um, all of the boys and it's just something you well it's something that i personally was taking for granted for, for before that like i was taking yeah. for granted um like my teammates my co i just thought that it would it would always be there i just thought um i thought they would always be there and i could like do it by myself you know what i mean mm -hmm. that's why i like with all of those things because i was like nah i can do it on my own two feet and it took it took going through that whole process to realize um, like how important these people around me are to me and, and how invaluable they are and how it, I, it's a fact. Like, I can't do it. I can't do it without them. I can't do it without my coaches. I can't do it without my training partners. I can't do it without my teammates and, and the people that come along and support and the big machine of people and the, and the love from, from all the friends and family. Um, that gets you that gets you across the line like it, it took me going through that to be in the place i'm at now but now i just i just relish it i just appreciate it so to all be in the same place 
So four of us being fighting on the same card and to have everyone here is just, um, yeah, it's the most, it's definitely the, the, the most special um, event of, of my career. Yeah, it's because people that haven't been following along, it's been a little while since you've had that experience. Obviously, you were a bit of a bounty hunter. The UFC would pay you a certain amount of money, put it on someone's head. <laughs> then when you go around the world, you would rub them out. And it was just the Dan Hooker way of life for some time. And it didn't quite line up to the fight camps of some of your other teammates. And you kept saying to us, man, it would be great if I could <laughs> fight with the team. And then boom, Dan gets a fight here. Dan gets a fight there. But then the other thing is it's almost seven months since the Arnold Allen fight. And it's one of the longest breaks of your career. So not only have you had a chance to sort of recalibrate with your team and get ready for this fight with everybody else, I want to know, like, how important has this time off been for you? And what was it like having that much time off for a change compared to some of the other breaks you've had in between fights? Yeah, there's definitely there's definitely a lot of time. There's definitely a lot of time to, to process things and to improve. And... Um, that's that's kind of what I did. I I was just in the gym um, and getting better and, and working on the mistakes that I made and and fixing the holes that were in my game. And I feel like like I feel like um, like those fights that I took throughout the um, pandemic and stuff like that. They didn't necessarily like create any holes in my game. They just they just um, like revealed holes that were being covered up by great coaching and, and like phenomenal preparation. Like my team was so good and my training was so good that those holes never got shown. Um, but then when the preparation wasn't there and the, and the, and the uh, incredible coaching wasn't there and I was just there by myself, like those, those holes and those um, mental flaws and physical flaws, like they, they shone through. So it's something that you just have to be like very honest about uh, with yourself about. And I was able to um, spend the last seven months and kind of fix those holes, fix those um, flaws of my game. And now to reintroduce the incredible coaching and to reintroduce um, the phenomenal training camp um, with those holes being fixed is um, is exciting for me as as a fighter and as an athlete. It's it's very exciting. So I like it's also uh, it's also like impossible for me to regret any of the things that I did or regret that the path that I went through because I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't have faced those things. I wouldn't have um, fixed those holes and I wouldn't be in the place that I am now. So regardless of how difficult those circumstances was, I didn't um, necessarily spend that time beating myself up. I didn't spend that time, um, you know, with my bottom lip sagging down and being upset for myself, I spent that time um, improving. I spent my that time um, creating, uh, I used those challenging obstacles to create a better version of myself. Like that's, that's the only way I can describe it. Mm. And I, you love to hear, it, man, if you're a Dan Hooker fan, this is just music to your ears and like, what an incredible card to come back on UFC 281. The four of you guys, it's like the team, the, you know, the band's back together. It's like the NWO, the band's back together. The coaching staff is there. Um, I'm, I'm excited, man. Also, I, and, and that's also, I think what people love about you. Like anytime you've lost a fight, I know that like your, your stock went up so much after the Dustin Poirier fight because of the way you handled the loss. You went down on yourself and and it's that attitude of like no regrets, just like, hey man, life is a lesson and all these things, you know, kind of lead me to the answer. So I think people really appreciate that about you. I know last time uh, you sort of joked about how like, man, there's no way I'm making 145 again, but like in all seriousness, how did you sort of go about making that decision to, to return to lightweight and just in general, like choosing your next career moves after the Arnold Allen fight? Um... No, nah, that was that was pretty. That was like a definite straight after. Like I knew, um, I knew what I was doing. I knew it was like a calculated risk and stuff like that. But it's definitely something that I wouldn't. Um, it's definitely something I wouldn't have done if I had my team around me mm. and stuff like that. Um, but again, it's it's a it's a it's a fresh start. You know what I mean? Like something like that. Um, like I was saying, like I wouldn't be in the position I am now if I hadn't gone through those challenging experiences. Like even like back to I'm talking like back to back losses. Like mm. that is um, 
that's like somewhat of a of an ego death. You know what I mean? Like that that is just earth shattering for a fighter whose whose ego is supposed to be like the biggest thing and you're supposed to be, you know, this big strong person that's can beat up anyone in the world, you know what I mean? Mm. And then to have to face those things um back to back, that that was to me where the real growth was because there was after two losses like that, there, there is absolutely no hiding. There's no hiding um, from um, the mistakes that you made. There's no hiding from the holes in your game. There's there's no hiding from like the mental lapses um, that you are falling into. You have absolutely no choice but to, but to face those things and to fix those holes and to create um, a better version of yourself. So again, like I can't, I can't sit here and wish that they didn't happen. Because in the long run, um, I'm just going to be, I'm just going to be a, a, a much better version of myself um, because of those because of those difficult um, obstacles. Yeah, and you know, it's just in life, right? Like, if you don't take the risks, you don't get to find a better version of yourself. You don't get to learn. You know, whenever we watch you, Dan, you're perfect to us. You're our Dan Hooker. We've got the boardroom, so it's hard for us to see any holes or flaws in any of your performances, but. I wonder, like, for those people that may be wondering what you're referring to when you talk about these holes, whether it be mental or physical, uh, skill-wise, or anything like that, could you sort of highlight a couple of key ones that you really sort of had to focus on over this time that really stood out to you? Yeah, oh, there's like there's there's like been a number of things um, mm-hmm. which I've faced and and had to work on. Um, so I would say, well, definitely. Definitely, is my um, propensity to to my my when I when I the moment when I decide to kind of throw throw my <laughs> back here, <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> Dan Hooker mode. You yeah. know what I mean? <laughs> that's like that's one of the things which I've had to face and and I've had to um, fix. And that's definitely like that was a. Um, like that's a moment in the fight where it's kind of it's leading into the the like when you're starting to fatigue and your body's starting to fatigue and things like that. And then I'm holding on to um, like I'm like grasping onto it. I'm thinking, man, I'm, I'm grasping onto certainty. I'm this is not supposed to happen. This is not how the fight was supposed to go. So then you get like that shortness of breath and you start to panic. So it's like very difficult as a fighter to um, admit these kind of things. It's very difficult as a fighter to look yourself in the mirror and be like, oh man, I was fatigued, then I panicked. Those mm-hmm. are like the two Those are like the two worst things um, that can happen to you in a fight. So they're very difficult things for a fighter to admit. And the only way you're gonna actually really look yourself in the mirror and admit these kind of faults um, is, in in a position like a position I'm in, so I'd say that's like one of the things. Another thing I would say is um, like just finding finding the right formula to to create um, consistency throughout my career. I'd say that's another thing which I've um, worked long and hard to find, and we we've all seen it like throughout my career. Some some performances, uh, some incredible performances. Sometimes you go out there, you watch a Dan Hooker fight, and you just go. That guy could be um, anyone. That guy could be any fighter in the world. You know what I mean? But then to just find um, the formula and to find um, the recipe and the right ingredients to create that performance um, consistently for the rest of my career, I feel like that's something um, that I've also found and, and also worked. Um, yeah, I've worked long and hard on 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 cooking up the right cooking mm-hmm. up the right recipe. What about the uh, expectation from your fans? Like, I know that whenever someone says Dan Hooker's about to fight, a lot of people are like, oh, the Dan Hooker mode is about to come to this card. You know, like I almost feel like because you've had so many wars, so many awesome performances, there's this weird expectation, especially from the New Zealand fans of, okay, like Dan's going to do this. He's going to put it all on the line and he's going to sort of push the action. I like it would be impossible for me to imagine what that would be like as an athlete and a professional fighter whenever you go places and people have these weird expectations from you. But I wonder, like, did that at any point sort of affect that Dan Hooker mode maybe switching on a little bit early? 
or maybe coming on a bit more than it needs to be? Definitely, um, definitely in my in my last two fights. Like this has all been, um, yeah, this has all been spent a lot of time and worked on. But that that um, that definitely came to me in like in the, like the last few fights where I I wanted to go out and, and put on a show in those last few fights. I wanted to go out and put on a fight, and and that that um, yeah, that that definitely like led me astray. It led me too close in the in the Islam fight, like being taken down. Um, and then same as on the back, instead of staying patient and doing what I was supposed to do, just wanting to push the fight and wanting to put on a show and just trying to rush my way back to my feet and, and getting forgetful and, and making a making a silly mistake. Um, and then in the Arnold Allen fight, like him moving backwards, very good on the counter, um, being very defensive. And then again, like me wanting to put on a show for the fans and wanting to get the knockout and wanting another one of those highlight reel um, moments and, and pushing the fight too hard and forcing the fight. So I'd say that like that that reaction and that level of expectation definitely in, in the last two fights became like a very, um, became very confronting, but that's another thing which I feel like I've spent some time on and and worked on and and improved on now i don't have that um that cycle of expectation because obviously when people when you're you're thinking about what other people are thinking like that's just the mm. that's just the downward spiral mm. when you get stuck in the same moment and you get stuck in a very it's just a very repetitive cycle mm. like they want you to this you like <laughs> it's a very repetitive cycle so instead of doing that i'm um, i'm here i i feel like i'm a much better version of myself and i'm i'm here to create another moment i'm not here i'm not here to replicate um a moment from the past or or reenact um some of these crazy highlight reels that i've done um in the past i'm here to create um a create a, a completely new moment and so i have me as a fighter i have absolutely no idea what that's going to look like I just know the shape that I'm in. I know um, my physical and mental capabilities, and I'm yeah, I'm like a, a just a painter with a with a blank canvas. I'm just excited. I don't know what I'm going to draw yet. You know what I mean? I'm, I won't know. I won't know till I'm out there and and I'm um, and I'm stroking it. You know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> There's a headline. Dan Hooker says he's stroking it ahead of UFC 281. <laughs> there you go. There's I, your headline. I love it. Hooker says, Hooker says he's stroking it. Stroking <laughs> it in New Jersey sounds like a Bruce Springsteen song. <laughs> <laughs> I, I am cute. And by the way, I love the honesty and the candor, man. Yeah. This is this uh, this is my favorite part of these chats. Also, the spicy banter. Uh, but how did the Claudia uh, Puelles fight come together? Because uh, I'm curious about that process. And also, he said last month that uh, he asked for you specifically back in May. So when did the U the UFC matchmakers actually hit you up about him? Um, I actually wouldn't have a clue. Like again, uh, like it's been it's been seven months. There's been a lot of changes. It's not it's not going to be like any one thing moving forward. It's it's a number of things. We all know. Like I was um, like I was managing myself, and I was dealing with the UFC directly, and I was booking my own fights. Um, and that was that as well was. Um, putting me in situations that weren't this, like I wasn't making the wisest decision. I was making the decisions as a fighter, mm. not, not um, the decisions that a manager would make or, or someone that you trust um, would make or someone giving you advice. It's not, I wasn't following the advice of the people around me, that, which I trust. You know, I was just thinking as a fighter and, and pulling the trigger on, on every fight that was thrown my way. So how this Claudio fight came together, I would have absolutely no idea. This is, um, it's out of my hands. My coach, Eugene Beerman and um, Ash from Attain Peace Management, they've been taking care of my career. They've they booked this fight. Um, they would have told me a few months ago that, that I was going to be on this card and to start preparing and the name came through. So yeah, it's, um, it was, it was out of my hands. So whether he asked for it or he put my hand, he put his hand up for it, um, credit to him. It's, uh, it's a, it's a tough fight and he him himself, he's, he's an exciting opponent. So I'm just looking forward to it. Yeah. So like 
I want to get your thoughts on him because, you know, since losing the tough Latin America three uh, show all the way back in 2016, he's racked up five nice wins and three of those being knee bars for those that haven't really followed his career. So break down this kind of the kind of challenge that you see Claudia bringing here in New York to you. Yeah, very talented um, young fighter. He's, he seems to be growing and developing in in, um, in leaps and bounds. He's he's um, seems very capable on the feet. Um, and yeah, the knee bar finish is is an exciting uh, challenge. He's he's got it on some some very high level grapplers. He's got it on um, like his last fight was against Clay Guida, and he was able to knee help knee bar. You know. Um, outstanding grappler in the division and so and, quickly and the way he locked it in so quickly and you know that's something that um clay would have been preparing for because he he would have had two coming into the ufc before that fight and then he was able to pull off a third one so yeah he, he's a he's a tough exciting challenge and it's an opportunity um for myself to prove where i belong and where i lie in the division Mm. And let's be honest, the only bar you'll be going to in New York is for a pub talk with our friend Oscar Willis. No <laughs> knee bars in the plans. It is. It is. <laughs> it, is pen- it is penciled in. Well, it is like, it's a, we're going to do it. Okay. Let's just say we're going to do it. <laughs> I would like to do it, preferably after the fight, and I can have some, I can actually have some beers. That would be my preference. Why not do both? As, any, as, as any Dan Hooker fan knows, who knows how the fight's going to go. Why not do both? You can do one before, hype the fight, and then one afterwards and really sink some piss. We could. We could. And then, and then when you're hung over the next day, we'll get you on. You'll barely be able to speak. <laughs> good. <laughs> uh, there'll be another 20 missed calls. <laughs> Stage five clingers. That's right. That's hey, right. Listen, we, are, we love you, man. What can we do? <laughs> Sophomore going steady style. I, <laughs> <laughs> I got to also ask, man, um, we were talking to uh, Ben Askren just before, and he was saying how, like, the goal is so important when following any fighter's career. It's like you have to know what these people are fighting for, right? It, it was referenced to, like, other fighters and stuff. But you, you put up this post on Instagram, brick by brick, right? ahead of this Claudio fight. And I, I think that's sort of key in telling, but I'm curious, what did you mean by that? And also where do the bricks lead? What What is the, the ultimate goal for you? Yeah, it's about um, like going back, um, like repairing all of these things, repairing these holes in my game, putting, putting you know, now, now I'm very confident in my camp, I'm very confident in my team and my preparation. Um, yeah, brick by brick just means building a strong foundation because without a strong foundation it will it will all collapse and i feel like that's the position that i was in in the past where i was had a very high tower I had a very, my my tower was almost at the top you know what mm. i mean like I, I got in positions where i would have been you know the one fight away from the conor mcgregor or one fight away um from fighting for the title but i feel like those that there was not a strong foundation i feel like i had just had a stack of five tiers on top of each other and <laughs> like in hindsight looking back so coming coming around the bend it's it's about putting those foundations in place that when i get back to that position which obviously is a world title you will not see me compete in the ufc if if um the objective is not a world title i'm not in i'm not interested in anything else i'm not interested in the money i'm not interested um nothing else interests me except having the belt because the belt means you're the best fighter in the world and when i lose sight of that uh yeah i i, I really find no interest in fighting without the opportunity to become to become the best in the world mm. i saw this great article about you um on the new zealand herald it was the biggest questions that dan hooker wants to answer at ufc 281 by christopher reeve who by by the way does fantastic work unfortunately it was behind a paywall and it was asking a dollar ninety nine, and I'll tell you, <laughs> times are tough. Ben. Times are Hi, tough ben. at SRHQ. So I never actually got to read the article. So I'll just ask you the question, Dan. What are the biggest questions that you want, Chris? <laughs> Love so you, Chris. Cost you three, four, five dollars at least. <laughs> I don't want to pay the two bucks either. So I don't know. <laughs> what are the biggest questions? But this is actually a serious question. What are the biggest questions that you want to answer at uh, UFC two eighty one with this fight? 
Um, no, nah, nothing, nothing. I'm, I'm, I'm focused on myself, and I'm focused on, um, I'm focused on what I'm doing, and I'm focused on, on creating, creating something. I'm focused on, on drawing a masterpiece. That's, that's the only thing that I have any kind of real focus on. It. I have, um, yeah, I just have like a clarity, clarity of vision, and it's a very, um, it's a very cool place to be where I'm not trying to prove anything to anyone else or trying to put on an amazing fight or trying to knock someone's head off. Like I'm just going to go out there and perform at the level that I'm capable of performing on. That's the only thing that I can focus on and people can react to that. Um, however they want to react to that. But mm, yeah, my mindset's focused on creating. Well, I know you mentioned the title is always a goal. So just before we wrap down, I want to do, I do want to get your thoughts on the new champ in the division, Islam Markachev. I, I mean, a lot of people sort of seeing this, as, you, as a monumental sort of change in the division, I suppose. But I want to get your thoughts, man. Like, what do you think of him being the new champ? And what did you think of his win over your old mate, Charlie Olives? Yeah, obviously, um, like a phenomenal performance going out there. And, and yeah, I feel like, and, and doing that to a guy like Charles, who had a very impressive run um, as a champion. And then um, I think the biggest hesitation people had about Islam becoming the champion that he wouldn't fight um, regularly or wouldn't be as active as like a guy like Charles or uh, Charlie Ollis. Charles. <laughs> he wouldn't be, I can't even say it from a name I went to. I went to, I went to. <laughs> <laughs> he tried, then, guys. For, um, for Islam to turn around very quickly and to, to call out Alexander Volkanovsky, who I feel like, I feel like they're, they're doing it because obviously it's a chance at the number one pound for pound, but I feel like they're kind of looking down at me like, oh man, we'll go snatch up this featherweight real quick. But they're, they're really in for, they're in for a, a, a whole lot of trouble. That's an incredibly difficult man to, to hold on the ground. Like they keep saying he's short and stuff like that, but holding him on the ground, holding a guy that, that that's that um, stocky on the ground is incredibly difficult. So I feel like he's in for a, incredibly tough test and Alex Volkanovsky in Perth. Oh, I did. I can't wait. Um, I was speaking to Oscar about it because we, we spoke to Volko last week and just like his intensity and his confidence is just infectious, man. It's like you can be the biggest doubter and then you, you hear Volko talk and you're just like, dude, he's like, he's going to do it, man. Like I just, I don't know. I love it. I love it. They're, they're both in their prime super fight down this part of the world. You you would for sure be gunning for, oh, I'm, I'm curious. Would you be gunning to fight here at UFC Perth? Uh, you know, if everything goes to plan, uh, UFC 281? Yeah, if the stars all, all, all fall in the right places and, and everything comes together, that, that would be obviously the ideal circumstance. But yeah, I'm, I'm focused on, it's a pretty big, it's a pretty monumental event to, to get through before we yeah. can yeah. off our sights on something else. Madison Square Garden, um, pay-per-view, it's going to be, it's going to be a big one. That's right. The big one, the big one. Uh, speaking of big ones, just super quickly, uh, no point having a big one if you don't take care of it. Am I right, fellas? Uh, yeah, I wouldn't know. Uh, whether you have a big one, <laughs> small one, medium one, any size one, I'm talking downstairs, uh, nothing makes it look better and bigger than trimming around the base, you know, similar to mowing the lawn around a, uh, a tree. And whatever you have, make sure you take care of it. By doing that, by grooming it nicely, instant 100% boost of confidence. And who better to do it with than our good friends at Manscaped sporting their lawn mower, which, by the way, is now available in Woolworth stores all over Australia here. The taking over, it's not just the Anzac takeover, it's the Manscaped takeover. And hey, with Christmas around the corner, holidays, you're buying people gifts, you're scratching your head what to get. Man, the lawnmower, the pound for pound, greatest grooming tool in the world. I'm talking about that waterproof feature. I'm talking about the LED light. I'm talking about the ceramic blade and skin safe patented technology. Pound for pound, greatest grooming tool in the world. And you can even get the performance package 4.0 online with lawnmower 4.0 trimmer or the weed whacker ear and nose hair trimmer as well the ultra premium body wash ultra premium two-in-one shampoo and conditioner ultra premium deodorant crop preserver anti-chafing ball deodorant crop reviver ball spray toner and the free gifts the boxes and the shed travel bag joining the six million other men worldwide taking care of their junk and uh, no better gift isn't that right dennis 
That's right, man. Get the package for your package and get 20% off with the code word submission and free shipping today. And Manscaped now gets sorted for Christmas thanks to Manscaped. And guys, get ready for this huge UFC 281 card by making some serious cash with our friends at my bookie. Did you guys know you guys can make 100% match deposit right now by using the code word submission? That's right. Claim your deposit bonus dollar for dollar all the way up to $1,000. And just quickly, let's have a look at some of these odds. you got Alex Pereira versus Israel. Adesanya Alex at plus 136. Israel at minus 175. Which way will you be leaning? Or what about Michael Chandler, who's plus 144 versus Dustin Poirier, minus 185. No matter what the bet is, there's only one place to make, and that is with our friends at MyBookieCast. That's right. While you're making money, make sure to save some money this holiday season. You're buying all sorts of gifts, but you know you can get those same exact gifts for a cheaper price just by using a VPN like NordVPN. You know, different countries have different prices for the exact same product. If you're buying Netflix in Mexico or your computer thinks you're in, you're in Mexico, you're actually paying cheaper money for it. And Dennis did it with the NBA League Pass. Uh, he made his computer think he was in like, I don't know, Philippines or Indonesia. Uh, and it came down a, a whopping amount. Works for flights as well. Works for pay-per-views as well. Works for all sorts of subscription services and just all sorts of products and gifts as well. We know you're doing your Christmas shopping. Also, protect your data. You don't want any of these stupid data breaches affecting you as we're seeing every week. Block your internet service provider from seeing any of the spicy websites you're watching or checking out. And best of all, no speed throttling and no buffering, no issues like that at all. NordVPN, the absolute best, isn't that right, Dennis? That's right, man. Look, if you just do the conversion right here, our friends in New Zealand paying so much more for every single thing. What about the US currency doing so well against the Australian dollar right now? Why not check out the Australian websites, see what kind of deal you can get. The possibilities are absolutely endless, and you guys can start the saving right now by taking advantage of this amazing Nord deal where you go to nordvpn.com forward slash submission, get a huge discount off your NordVPN plan, plus four months for free. It's completely risk-free with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee or click the link in the description right now and try it today. There you go. All right. Just quickly, uh, Dan, we'll let you go. Probably a couple more quick predictions from us and then we'll get out of your hair because I know you're busy. But I have to ask, man, you fought both of these men before. Michael Chandler taking on Dustin Poirier. How do you see that one playing out? Yeah. Um, that's a tough one to pick. Mm. That's a tough one to pick. Just the, obviously, like the aggression on Michael Chandler is the thing that, that kind of catches people out, that he... He's just very, um, yeah. He he's willingly reckless. Like that's that's the only way I can like truly describe it. Like he like when he says it, he he truly means it. Like he's here for a good time, not a long time. That's um that's him to a T. So he's always going to be an incredibly dangerous fighter um, early on in that first round. Um, Dustin Poirier, however, obviously one of the most durable fighters. Um, he's a very difficult man to catch in that first round, and he he he. Yeah, as the fight leads on, like he's he's very comfortable. He's been in those certain positions um, for a lot of time before. I don't see Chandler um, having the ability to kind of take Poirier out very early, and then just the pace and and yeah, the pace and the durability of Poirier. I think, but. Your guess is as good as mine, Nate. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. Last prediction here, and that's, of course, your teammate Israel. He takes on Alex Pereira. I know, like, this is something that we've all discussed previously, but now you guys are in that X-Men compound right now. The fight is just days away. So I want to sort of get your last-minute thoughts on this one. You also saw Israel in training. You guys prepared together. Now that it's almost time for the fight, how do you see him getting it done? A lot of people are still wondering if – is if this finishes up on the feet like the last couple of fights and Israel puts him out or if Israel utilizes some of his, you know, MMA abilities to take him down and quickly submit him and in the, in the gaps that a lot of people think that Alex still has. Um, I feel like it's entirely up to Israel for this mm. fight. But like he he's the one that gets to dictate this. I feel like he can beat. Um, Alex, if he just keeps it on the feet, like that's the funny thing about it. Like people don't actually go back and spend the time. They didn't see the footage. It. Yeah, I, I saw the one. Um, I saw like Suhudo puts out a video and he's um, he's giving a breakdown of the fight. He's like, uh, you know, Alex beat Israel in this fight, and then he rematched him and he knocked him out. Like he has the striking advantage. Like he was. 
But that was his claims. And then someone obviously commented and they were like, uh, I can't remember who called him out. Someone called him out and was just like, did you watch the fights? Like, here are links to the fights. Like, if you mm. could watch the fight and then give an opinion on the fight. Because that's the funny thing about it. Like, mm. people are so interested in, like, what's next? What's next? What's next? They, they don't actually put the time in to, to sit down and study and actually watch the fights. Like, I would say, like, 99% of people since this fight got to put together, probably haven't gone back and actually watched either of those two fights. You know, the the first fight, I, f I feel like um, Israel won that fight. The second fight was he was handling very comfortable and then got caught with a got caught with the punch, which is just the nature of <laughs> nature of our business. So to say that you know Alex has a kind of striking advantage doesn't make much sense. He's obviously a very well, a uh, acclaimed kickboxer and one of the very mm, elite guys in the world and carries a lot of power for the division. But I feel like Israel right now is is on a whole nother level. But I feel like if he wants to grapple him, he can grapple him too. I feel like this is Israel's fight. And the good thing about this fight or, or what makes it so exciting is that Alex is not going to stop coming forward. Mm. Like he, he will... He will. Um, he's gonna fight, kill or be killed. That that like this. This is his one shot. Whereas like the other guys, you know, they start they they like might start losing, and they're just like, all right, like I last it out, get a couple of wins. I can obviously change a few things in my training, change my approach, come back and have another crack. Um, Alex has like been rushed to the title shot, obviously. Mm. So like another crack is not really there. Like if he if he rides out of a five round decision and like loses like a few of the other opponents, um but he's gonna go back and fight like Derek Brunson or he's gonna go back and fight like one of these guys that's just gonna grab him and chuck him on the ground. Like he's not mm. <laughs> <laughs> he's not gonna be able to work himself back into a title shot. Um so yeah, I feel like it's going to be a kill or kill, be killed fight, and I feel like Israel has all the cards in this one. I can't wait, man! It's going to be a sick fight. It's going to be a sick event. There's also Brad, there's Carlos, and then of course you, Dan Hooker versus Claudia Poyas, UFC 281, November 12th. It's going to be the 13th for everybody here in Australia and New Zealand. Follow the man on Instagram at Dan Hangman. Follow the man on Twitter at Dan the Hangman. Check out his excellent New York mm -hmm. supporters tea at Engage. Engage doing phenomenal things, and then arguably the most important, not one, but two pub talks. I'm pretty sure we just, I mean, this is official at this point, basically. One before the fight, one after the fight. I, the big arc of the second one. Okay. That's... One thing's for sure, if, you, if, if, if afterwards you're expecting 20 DMs from the boys, you're dead wrong, Dan. It's going to be 40 messages from the boys, all right? You better prepare yourself, man. Best of luck. Best of luck at UFC 281. The Dan Hooker Show is back. Thank you so much for your time, and uh, best of luck, man. Lots of love. Cheers, boys. Nah, thank you for the time. I appreciate it.